Hi, everybody. My name is Dave Plenticum. You can find me on LinkedIn. And also I have a blog on InfoWorld.com. But today I'm going to talk to you about a very important topic. This is going to be the topic of cloud governance. And moreover, the ability to be more effective with cloud governance by leveraging dynamic cloud governance, which is a new concept and things like governance as code and other things are starting to emerge. And we're going to go over not only what governance is and kind of the fundamental issues around governance, but how to leverage governance effectively and how to really kind of map your own plan to make governance effective for your enterprise. So let's get going. So you got to keep in mind that governance is a, is kind of an old topic. It's been around since the 80s, since I started to hear about it. And it's the ability to put guardrails around how we're using resources, such as storage and compute and databases and uh, APIs and things like that. So you got to remember that governance is really about the ability to leverage processes and tools to create policies. And these policies are like little programs that surround the particular thing we're looking to govern. In the case, we have resources, services, accounts, applications, and data. And any number of things can be governed and they can be governed for any reason. And keep in mind, it's different than security, which really security is about allowing you and disallowing you access based on the credentials that you have, where governance is around putting guardrails around using particular resources, really to keep you out of trouble, not necessarily to limit the use of those things, but also to make sure that IT is running effectively and that you're working and playing well together to create true solutions that are able to scale. So what would a world look like without governance? Well, governance, the reality, keeps us out of trouble as a human being, but it also keeps applications and processes out of trouble and doing things such as saturating a compute system, uh, such as deleting data that they're not authorized to delete, uh, such as accessing resources and leaving them up and running for a long period of time. And say you're using a cloud provider like Amazon Web Services, you, you launch a storage instance, and everybody does this who works in the cloud and forgets to put that instance away once you're done. And by doing so, we're running up a huge bill. Well, that's governance, your ability to kind of keep us out of trouble and to keep us from, in essence, driving up the uh, cost of computing and the ability to not destroy what we're doing with computing. So where security keeps us out of trouble in terms of not allowing access to systems that we're not authorized to see or other people are unauthorized to see or leverage, governance really kind of puts rules and governing policies around using any number of resources. It could be a, a macro resource like storage and compute, an API, an application, things like that. So a world without governance is going to be uh, a bad world. And so for moving into cloud computing, cloud governance really kind of eliminates a lot of the risk and provides us with better productive paths and how we're better productive paths and how we're going to move forward with this. So the key foundations of governance, and we'll see this uh, during the presentation, we kind of use this as a framework, you know, would be visibility, policies, compliance, security, costs, automation, and tooling. And it's important that we understand what these different components do and how they relate to the core notion of governance. So Let's get going. So when we do governance and do visibility, we're providing a complete inventory of resources and the configurations. In other words, we can see everything out there. We can see the APIs, we can see the resources, we can see the processes, we can see the applications. And once we have that inventory of resources, we're able to configure how we're able to access or not access those resources and rules and regulations that we're writing that are specific in a policy that's going to provide us with the guardrails for accessing whatever that resource is. Uh, it's real time and historical. You know, it has a time series based events. We're able to see how things occur out there in the world. In other words, as it's happening, as well as historical information. In other words, performance data over time, usability data over time, uh, cost and people who are spending money on a particular resource over time, uh, consistent views across multiple clouds. And so we're able to look at not only resources in a single cloud provider, but really cross, cross cloud resources. Most people, 95%, according to the 
our analytics that I see and the analysis that I see are leveraging multi-cloud computers for the deployment of their various systems. And by doing that, you're gonna have different cloud brands and you're certainly gonna have things like private clouds and legacy systems and things like that. Your ability to see across those environments is really key. You gotta remember if we just had governance that focused on a single cloud provider, that's only solving the problem for a single cloud provider. Worse is if we deploy governance systems on each cloud provider. That's only gonna solve the problem on each cloud provider, but do so in very different ways using very different tools where we have to maintain the talent and uh, maintain the uh, uh, capability to deal with these complex systems. So in other words, we're removing ourselves from having governance complexity be a problem by leveraging visibility as the means of looking across the various systems, including a multi-cloud environment. So policies are the way you define governance tools work and, and they're very much like little programs. Uh, they can be very simplistic in the way in which you write them. They're normally procedural. They're normally very static. They normally don't take that long to write. And the reality is that they need to be versions and you need to understand how they're interdependent one to another, how one policy is depending on another policy is it's depending on another policies. For example, we may have a policy which controls access to resources at a time of day, which may check into another policy which is based on the capacity of resources they're able to leverage. For example, we're only allowing one gigabyte of storage to be allocated and provision per day. And you can only do it at a particular time of day. Those may be very distinct policies under themselves, but that's an example of a policy, two policies that are exist that are interdependent one to another. Kind of keep that in mind. That's a capability of governance that uh, is going to be very helpful moving forward. So you got to remember that the core components of a policy around what condition and action, what the resource that we're governing, you know, is it an API, a storage systems, things like that. The condition or the properties that we're putting up, in other words, when we can access the resource and what we can do with the resource and putting limitations around that. That by the way, doesn't mean we're denying developers and people who need the resource from using it. We're just putting limitations on the way that resource is used to keep people and processes and applications out of trouble when leveraging the resource in a certain way that may be um, detrimental to the using of the system, we run up too much cost, use up too much capacity, saturate the resource, things like that. And also what actions you need to take. You know, for example, report, notify, trigger, workflows, et cetera. And uh, so we figure out what resource we're governing, which conditions we're looking for, are the rules that we're putting around using that resource and the actions that you need to take if the, those conditions aren't met or maybe are met, you know, such as reporting, that someone is leveraging this resource that they shouldn't be. And therefore you can have an automatic action take place or a human being could uh, intervene and email the person who's leveraging the resource in an incorrect way. We're able to notify either the user or the administrator of the system. And we're able to trigger workflows that kick off other automation processes from uh, dealing with the um, person application or processes that's leveraging the, uh, uh, the resource in a way that uh, maybe out of bounds for the policies that we wrote. So keep in mind, there's several dimensions of governance. We're dealing with compliance, we're dealing with costs, we're dealing with security. And compliance is important for governance, certainly continual compliance or continuous compliance where we're able to manage policies that allow us to adhere to certain governmental regulations, you know, such as HIPAA use of data, uh, the ability to leverage different security standards, the ability to look at different compliance aspects such as, uh, you know, generally accepted accounting principles if you're running an accounting firm. So these are rules and policies that deal with the specific way that we deal with regulations and laws. Cost basically keep things within budget. It's not only monitoring the way in which we're uh, leveraging costs or, or spending money in the particular cloud governance scenario, um, but we're putting limitations on those costs. So in other words, it, you, you can't spend a million dollars on, uh, on a cloud service. Uh, there's gonna be limitations or policies based on that. There may be limitations or policies that are based on uh, the accounting systems in the, in the account settings you have in the particular cloud provider, but in many instances as part of FinOps, as part of a cloud-based system where you're setting those things programmatically to deal with putting limitations on how much people can spend and also what they can do with it. You know, there 
have to spend across various resources. They can't uh, spend all their uh, their money on storage systems. They have to spend money on compute as well. Things like that are valuable in setting up within the cost budgetary constraints. And security for access. In other words, governance systems work with security. So we not only put limitations and bounds on how we're accessing resources, but are also working with security systems to make sure that one of those policies is that they're authenticated and have the credentials to access a particular resource. Again, we're trying to keep ourselves out of trouble and making sure that that person is authorized to see that resource is absolutely gonna be fundamental to the success of the governance system. So security and governance work together and it's kind of a one plus one equals three scenario. And remember security is about access. It's about looking at how we're dealing with identities and how we're dealing with roles and responsibilities and whether we're allowing or disallowing access to particular resources, it could be a macro resource such as storage or an API or an application, things like that. Governance, we're looking at policies around using those resources and one can't exist without the other. You have to remember that security systems are able to work with governance systems, are able to have deeper visibility into what those systems are doing and also different behaviors that are allowed or disallowed around those particular resources. So for instance, the governance system could notice that you know, saturation may be occurring that's out of bounds of the particular policies that we set on the number of CPU cycles that we can use for a particular resource. And that may do a couple of things. Number one, keep us out of trouble in getting a big cloud bill, but it could also alert the security system that there's, there's a potential breach there. In other words, the resources are being saturated. And while that could mean that uh, developers are not doing the responsible thing and using the CPU in the correct manner, it could mean the fact that we're uh, being attacked and uh, someone is saturating the, uh, the CPU, which could mean that uh, 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 shenanigans is afoot and we need to you know, go correct those issues and therefore alert the security system. But in this case, it was alerted by the governance system. So simple security policies do things such as delete and notify you know, users publicly exposed databases, uh, you know, ultimately um, were able to, you know, keep us out of trouble by removing the data from visibility of the systems. So for publicly exposing databases because it's not configured properly, uh, we're able to take actions uh, to deal with that using security systems. Notify users of account with certain tags that don't have multi-factor authentication turned on. So in other words, we're looking through the system to make sure we're living up to the policies around dealing with security, such as the fact that everybody who logs on to our particular system or this particular database has to be confronted with multi-factor authentication, your ability to leverage that in, in the correct ways. Then unencrypted storage buckets notify the users with regions. Uh, for example, we're, uh, we're unencrypting uh, object systems. We notify users uh, within reasons of this uh, issue and they need to go forward and fix the issue. And for example, if they don't fix the issue in a five day period of time, we've having the policy uh, to delete the data. And so in other words, remove it from harm's way. If we've notified the owners that they're unencrypted storage buckets that are there and they don't do it within a certain amount of time, in this case, five days, we're just gonna remove the thing from online. And so therefore protecting ourselves and protecting the data. So all these things are you know, possible. The ability to notify users when NFA ultimately isn't turned on, the ability to delete and notify uh, users of uh, public exposed databases, we're really kind of taking care of the self and we're defending the various systems from outside bad actors that are attacking the system when we're doing so at a couple of levels. Number one, we're creating security policies to do it, which examples are here. But we're also working and playing with the government, working and playing well with the governance systems that provides us another layer of protection. In this case, the ability to put guardrails around the various systems. So keep in mind that cost governance is, a, is probably one of the more important features we're hearing today. Everybody's paying more for cloud than they should. And so if you're looking at cost governance and you get into the notion of financial operation or FinOps and cost governance is key to controlling what people spend and putting limitations on people spends. Now in the past we had, you know, static policies around cost governance. In other words, you can only spend up to $1000 and if you spend over $1000 we're going over $1000 then your account would get turned off or you would be uh, disallowed from allocating any more resources and spending more money. Now we're using things such as dynamic policies, which have the ability to put behavior around that. So it's in many instances, those things aren't necessarily static. So we may have, for example, a thousand dollar limitations, but there may be conditions that we're leveraging 
to take that to another level. In other words, we're saying if you're trying to spend over a thousand dollars, we're going to check for other things. We're going to check for the, you know, time of day that you're doing it. We're going to check for the applications that you're in. We're going to check for uh, compliance issues that may be coming into play. We're going to check for multiple things, which may mean that you are allowed to spend more than a thousand dollars for that particular instance based on you meeting other conditions. So therefore, Financial operations is not just putting rules and regulations and budgets in place and how we're going to take things to the next level. FinOps and the ability to deal with financial regulations and financial policies is about putting behavior around. We're doing those things, behavior and how we deploy and spend money, how we're allocating resources and how those resources are being accounted for. Governance is the heart of this. Basically, it's the heart of financial operations or FinOps. So sample cost policies would be to turn resources off, you know, during office hours, you know, the weekends. In other words, if, if no one should be using the resources, then we have to make sure that all the storage systems that have been allocated and provisioned have been spun down. Be able to identify or deprovisioned under underutilized resources and inform the development team. So in other words, leaving things out there, zombie processes, storage systems that are allocated and not put back, we're able to return them to the pool of resources so we're not paying for them. And then setting the appropriate data retention policies on, um, on resources that are uh, cyclical. So in other words, we're putting limitations on how we're spending the money around these particular resources. And we're making sure that these retention policies are managed longer term and managed over time and durable over time. And again, we're doing this with dynamic policy uh, behavior you know, versus static policy behavior where the various uh, policies are you know, not just set in stone and very have static procedures that have, are immovable off a particular area of logic, but are conditional in the way in which we're looking at these various policies, how they denote behavior and how these behaviors are assigned to how we're dealing with governance of the systems. So automation ultimately is key. Uh, if we're dealing with governance, we don't want to have to uh, send a message to a human being to take off and deal with these governance systems. So we have to automate these things and how these processes are carried out. So we're able to take a policy, understand an event, you know, someone going over utilization of resources, things like that, and have some sort of an automated response. We're not necessarily requiring that human beings have to get involved in every uh, instance where someone is falling out of a governance policy. This is the great, uh, this is the thing where dynamic policies uh, come in handy and certainly policies as, as governance as code, we're able to define exactly how we're going to automate a response and take care of the issue and doing so without a human being even having to be involved in the process. And that's, that's a critical success factor because if you have human beings involved in this, that's where things and errors are made. It's not done in a consistent way. And then it's very difficult to enforce policies where you're not doing things consistently. So automate, be consistent, you know, leverage automation technology to go out there and carry out uh, carry out enforcing the guardrails around the policy, but do so in a very sophisticated way. We're able to make decisions about how these things are enforced and how these things are going to be automated. So tooling, um, we have uh, different options out there. We have cloud native systems, uh, things that come along with a particular cloud provider like Amazon Web Services, you know, Microsoft and Google. We have third party tools, things that are provided by a third party provider of a governance system. Those are typically uh, advantageous because we're not locked into a particular provider. If you're dealing with a cloud native tool, which is native to a particular cloud system, that's usually the only system that they cover. They only cover their cloud and not the other clouds. Our derivative would be you know, third party tools and cloud native tools where they're kind of um, you know, basically a combination of both. So in other words, we have a third party tool but it's able to operate as a cloud native tool and perhaps do so on other different cloud providers. So it's able to have a cross cloud system uh, that runs on a particular cloud provider. It's native to that particular cloud provider, but it's able to work cross cloud. And these sorts of things you need to strike a balance. Um, if you're going to only deal with one cloud uh, for the rest of your enterprise architecture, then cloud native is gonna be perfectly fine, but that's never gonna be the case. You know, it really should be third-party derivative tools that allow governance to cross cloud systems and allow you to auto automate these systems and create dynamic policies across these systems and deploy them across these systems. So instead of doing it one time for each of the cloud providers, 
we're doing it one time cross clouds, one time to for three clouds versus you know, leveraging three different instances of governance systems. So we're driving behavioral change here. The guardrails and guidance and collaboration communication become kind of core to this. So we're not only just putting limitations to keep us out of trouble and people overusing a resource or using a resource at the wrong time of day or saturating something or overspending, but we're driving behavioral changes in the way in which developers and people who innovate the business are able kind of to take things to the next level for us. So this is about humans as well as automation. This is about humans collaborating and communicating one to another. And this is about leveraging guardrails as a teachable moment for how we're going to leverage these systems and keep ourselves out of trouble. You know, one of the things I found when I was a young programmer that I was very appreciative of people and processes that are put in place to keep me out of trouble versus something where I overspent on something or, or wrote a loop uh, in a system and it burned too many CPU cycles back when I was working for a hosting service and have to deal with the fallout of that. Um, so not only do these things keep us out of trouble automa using automation and pol enforcing policies, in this case, dynamic policies and governance as code, but also promotes behavioral changes in the way in which we deal with automation, a way in which we deal with technology. It's very important. So emerging trends in cloud governance, well, it's uh, really started out with active versus passive. Remember back in the service-oriented architecture days, we had governance around services, typically service governance, service-oriented architecture. And we had passive governance or basically governance policies and procedures that really did nothing. So in other words, they were there, we used them, you could refer to them, but they couldn't carry out any enforcement uh, technology that couldn't limit access to systems, things like that. So that's why we created active governance, the ability to uh, proactively respond uh, to you know, policy violations and policy changes. Influence in DevOps and infrastructure as code kind of popped up as that. So in other words, we're able to take governance to the next level by combining governance with programming. And the ability to build governance, which it should have always been, as well as security within the system development, application development lifecycle. So we're building systems with governance in mind. That got into governance as code, which is where we're moving today, which provides us with the, the ability to have dynamic capabilities within our governance system. So it's not a static policy. It's something we can uh, uh, test for context, for example, and, and do things and take different paths, uh, which really did denotes the fact that governance and a policy is going to behave in a certain way. It's not just gonna operate in a static procedural way. And that's very important. You gotta remember, Governance is gonna to have to have flexibility and the ability to adapt to different things and the ability to provide the developers with the capability of writing governance as code that's going to deal with different situations in much more sophisticated and much more useful ways. And so that's why we're looking at governance and code and dynamic policies today. And then finally, the use of AI and ML, artificially intelligent machine learning systems they're able to uh, take things to the next level with not only doing governance, which is procedural in nature, um, uses traditional uh, programming logic, but the ability to leverage inference engines, the ability to leverage uh, expert systems, the ability to leverage artificial intelligence systems, and machine learning to assist in how we do governance. And so if we're gonna do governance and carrying out um, in multiple ways, and we're able to learn as we go, the ability to save that information and in some sort of a knowledge base and build upon the capabilities of the policies dynamically, you know, through this knowledge base is gonna be a step up and moving in the right direction. So what now? Well, you know, do focus on what needs to get done. Uh, so ultimately, you know, this is about the ability to implement governance in a productive way that's gonna assist you in taking your cloud games, specifically your multi-cloud game to the next level. Don't focus on technology, focus on the reason that technology exists and why we need to take things to the next level. So in other words, we're not focused on a tool and trying to adapt our processes and our governance requirements around use of that tool. We're focused on our government, government governance requirements first, our security requirements first, and then back in the appropriate technology uh, into that and hire the right people and the talent you need to make the decisions. You need to look at the skills you're gonna to need to make the calls to get to this another level of dealing with cloud system and specifically cloud governance with people who are knowledgeable how cloud governance works and development works and the ability to build these things into your various systems. 
And don't get lost in the details, lots of details around with what governance is and what governance does. Um, and the reality is the details that you need to pay attention to are your details, the way in which you wanna implement this technology to take your game to the next level. And then finally, do you understand that this is an evolutionary process? This is gonna be continually learning as we move forward. We're gonna get better at it by iterating through these things. We're not gonna come out with a single governance solution that solves every problem that we have. This is about building upon the knowledge of governance, taking things to the next level, dealing with the security aspects, the data aspects, all these things that are really you know, part and parcel to building a successful cloud solution and a successful enterprise cloud solution. If you focus on that, this is going to be a journey that's gonna be very productive. If you focus on just trying to get to a right answer out of the gate and sticking with that no matter what, you're gonna find it's gonna be a little a bit of a bumpy road moving forward. So anyway, I hope this was helpful. Uh, we're looking to, in essence, take our game to the next level and how we're dealing with governance systems. And ultimately, this is something that you should focus on. Uh, you got We're sponsored by Stacklet. Stacklet has a dynamic governance solution. They have program, governance as code and other solutions that are out there. But really understand what governance is first. Taking this course was a step in the right direction. Understanding the value of this technology, understanding conceptually where we can take this and where this can go. And ultimately, that's the way you win the game. <laughs>